I'm continuing my series this morning on God with us. And last week we talked about God in the wilderness or in the valley. And today we're going to be talking about God in the wilderness. The anchor verse that we have uh, for this series up through the 24th is in Matthew chapter, 20, uh, chapter 1, verse 23. Look, the virgin will conceive a child and will give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. So the series God With Us is a, a theme that I'm going to continue because he's with us through the various chapters and the various phases, the various um, times of our life. And uh, life is not boring. Life is not always the same. And there are turns, there are twists, and there are things that take place in each one of our lives. And we understand this, God is with us. Now, last week, as we talked about the valley, we often enjoy him on the mountaintop, and it's easy to do that. But we learned last week, we get to know him in a very intimate way, in a more powerful way, when we're walking through the valleys. So today's metaphor, we're going to talk about the wilderness experience. It's different from the valley. I'm going to say that one of the biggest differences I'm thinking of when I think of the wilderness experiences regarding, uh, in contrast to the valley experiences, I, I'm thinking that the wilderness experiences are probably longer. They're probably longer. And, um, you know, we have people and we have even have scriptures that talks about they're wandering in the wilderness. And we know that they did that for a lot of years back even in the Old Testament. Then. So the metaphor of the wilderness is, is another term for possibly, you know, the, the trials of our life or the hardships that we're going through or the wanderings that we're going through. And uh, maybe it's one of those times when you just don't know what to do next. And, and during this wilderness experience, you know, do you stay in the job that you're in or do you move to another job? Uh, you know, you've got these school loans to pay back and you've got all this stuff going on, but you're kind of seeing it as this is a wilderness experience that I am going through right now. Do I continue to rent or do I try to find a home so I can maybe uh, build up some equity? Uh, you know, do I, do I purchase that home? Is it a good time or a bad time? And we look at that as possibly a wilderness experience. Um, <laughs> for a few, you know, it could be, do I keep dating this person? Or do I not keep dating him or her? It seems like sometimes it goes good and sometimes it doesn't. And I don't know why he hasn't asked yet. You know, I don't know why he hasn't popped the question. Do I, what do I do? So maybe for some, somewhere else in a faraway country, away from Plymouth, that could be their place. Okay, here we are. We're going to talk a little bit about the wilderness experiences. And, you know, it could be that, okay, you know, I have this deal going on and, 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 and you know, the kids, oh, what are they doing? And, uh... I don't know what's going to be the next chapter of their life because it's affecting this time of my life. So what is going to happen? Jesus, of all people, it was even Jesus himself. He experienced the wilderness experience in his life. What was it? He was baptized by John the Baptist. I mean, there was a voice that said, this is my beloved son whom I am well pleased and there was celebration, and it was exciting. And the very next verse, the very next verse says, then he was driven to the wilderness. Wow. Jesus Christ, he experienced the excitement and the good times, and then there was the wilderness experience for him. And for some, maybe you're there today. Maybe it's been a friend that has deserted you. Maybe it's been a friend that's been your friend for many, many, many years. And but today there has been a breach 
And that has ended, and, and, and you're really beside yourself. It could be that you're hating your job. You know, your, your spouse was dishonest with you. And now, today, you could be in this wilderness experience of hurt, confusion, and feeling empty. Now, now I made all of you feel good. Let's continue. At the top of your bulletin, this is the big thought for the day, Okay. And there's only two blanks to fill in today. And many of you love that. All right, here we go. Your deepest need becomes a gift when it drives you to depend on God. Your deepest need becomes a gift when it drives you to depend on God. Today we're going to go to the Old Testament. It's a familiar story to those who have been around the church for a little while. It's a story about Elijah. And he learned this principle. God used him in a massive way on the mountaintop experiences. Absolutely. But Elijah falls into depression and desperation. This guy that God used in in miraculous ways that we're going to talk about this morning. So we're going to look at this. Here it was. The backdrop of this would be it was it was King Ahab who told Jezebel all about Elijah and the Mount Carmel experience. And um, Jezebel sent word, said, send word to Elijah that by this time tomorrow, He'll be dead. I'm going to kill him. Well, verse number three, (laughs) Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. Some of you men are just looking straight up here. You're not looking to the left or to the right. You're, you're, You're not even moving. You're just going to look up here and look at the scripture this morning. Because of the threats of this woman, he was afraid and ran for his life. And when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. Now, the context of this, there was no Uber. There was no taxi. It was about 100 miles to where he was going. He came to a broom bush and he sat down under it and he prayed that he might die. This is pretty severe. This is scripture, okay? And then the next words are possibly some words that you have said more than once in your life. Maybe you said them Yesterday, maybe you said them last week. I have had enough. (laughs) I've had enough, Lord. As if God didn't know what he was thinking. He said, I have had enough. And then he didn't stop there. He said, take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. This is pretty severe. I can honestly say, I know a lot of people. I know a lot of leaders. I know a few people that are renowned. I know some people have gone through a lot of things. And I'm thinking this morning, and I was even thinking of this even the last two or three days, of all of those people that I've looked up to in my ministry, in my Christian walk, I don't know of any of them If they were feeling this way, they didn't let anybody else know about it. It, It's still a secret except to them and Jesus, okay? But here is this guy. He's running for his life. He's had enough. Now, I have said that when I was working on a project 
that from day one and from the very beginning of the project, I didn't know what I was doing. But I thought I would tackle it anyway. So I start the project. I remember back, this goes back years ago, and this has been many, many more current, but this one really hits my mind early this morning. I had this 1967 Plymouth Valiant. After I had the 64s and the 63s, the two doors, I bought just one for gas mileage and to drive back and forth to work and left the better car parked in the garage. And I remember I pulled that 67 Plymouth Valiant into my garage in Jeffersonville, Ohio, where we lived. And I thought, I'm going to put a muffler system on this tonight. And that way I can take it to work tomorrow and I'll have a brand new muffler system on it. <clears throat> That's been many years ago. That's been over 40 years ago. I promise you, I have never, ever one time in my life even begun to tackle a muffler job ever again. I learned my lesson. <laughs> I crawled off front of that car and I said, I've had enough. I'm done. And that's kind of a little funny deal. But you know what? There are some more serious things that go on in our life. There are some that are sitting here this morning. It could be because of your teenage child. You know, a teenager is still a child. Although when I was a teenager, I wasn't really a child. Neither were many of you. <clears throat> Let me just stop here. I think I have time. Does it seem like there's not a bunch of kids in here, but if they are, they, 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 they can hear this. It seems to me like, and I know people in education would know this better than I, except I've got some white hair. It seems to me like that people today are maturing later in life. And it probably was the same case between my dad's generation and my generation. But, I mean... It, at 17, 18, you worked a full-time job. You paid your own insurance on your car. You, you, you know, the whole, the, the, the whole deal. I, I don't understand why even today, with all the mo more modern things that we have and more opportunities that we have, and probably kids are smarter than maybe we were back in those days in many ways and maybe not nearly as smart in other ways, obviously, maybe, possibly. I, that's possible, just saying. <laughs> Let's pray. <laughs> But why, why, why is it? Okay, so, so, so it could be that maybe today you have kids, teenagers that are absolutely driving you crazy. There are things going on. You didn't, you didn't plan it. You didn't see it coming. You, you don't understand why. And you've got more information about it. And now, you know, so today you're saying, I've had enough. I don't know what to do next. I'm at the end of my rope. It's a wilderness experience. It very well could be because of that teenager. Maybe you have a boss that is aggressive and then impulsive and demanding, unreasonable, and it even appears to you, all indications could be that he's trying to get you fired because he's putting the pressure on you to the point where you're saying, I've had enough. Could be the case. I don't know. Maybe you were making some tremendous strides in your finances. I mean, you're paying some things off and you're, 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 and, and the car breaks down. The commode overflows. And just because it overflows doesn't mean, no, you know, it's upstairs and it ruined everything below it. So now you've got a big problem on your hand and you're saying, I've had enough. I don't know where it's at, but Elijah was running for his life. He had had enough. How can he handle it? How can he get through this? Maybe you made dinner for everybody, and it was the most amazing meal that you've ever, ever. And they ate it in, they ate it in 10 or 15, 20 minutes and ran out of the house and almost barely just said thank you. And now the house is empty, and you're sitting there with all this mess. And you might be like Jezebel. You might say, tomorrow this time they'll be dead. <laughs> I don't know. 
We all go through valley experiences. But let's look at the past of Elijah. This is a guy that stood down evil kings. He prophesied for the drought because of the, of the king's sin. Okay? For three years, he was a king. Uh, he, he, he forced uh, and, and pursued. This king was pursuing Elijah. And he hid. And when he was hidden, he was fed by the raven, ravens. He raised a dead boy to life. He stands down another 850 false prophets. He calls fire down from heaven. He destroys the pro false prophets. And he asks God for rain in a cloud that was the size of a hand. And, and it rained. This guy did amazing things. And now he's sitting under a broom tree running from a woman and says, I've had enough. I want to die. I'm not making this up. This is what the scripture says. Even when you read that and hear that, you might say, well, pastor, I'm not quite there. Well, I hope not. <laughs> but you're still in a wilderness experience. And it's still happening in your life. But he understood, he understood the protection of God. He understood the provisions of God. He understood the presence of God. And now, because of this angry woman threatens him, he falls apart. Guys, just keep looking up here, okay? <clears throat> when you see him, he's exhausted. And maybe today you can relate. You say, yeah, I, I'm going through some deep things and troubled things, and, and it's been a long time, and, and, and I don't know where it's going to end up. And yeah, and, and yeah, I didn't really call it that, but yes, Pastor, I'm in, I'm in the wilderness experience. Have you heard people say, I'm, I'm tired? Now, I'm from just south of Columbus, Washington Courthouse and area. And down there, a lot of the people, they didn't put the I in it. You know, they, they kind of say, I'm, I'm tired. I'm just tired. Bill Cosby years ago said, his mom said, she wasn't only tired, she was sick and tired. And when mom says she is sick and tired, he said, I know it's getting serious. But he was tired. And maybe he said, I'm just tired. Dr. Cloud, a Christian psychiatrist, psychologist, he said this. He said, I think maybe in the Christian community we have misdiagnosed what we mean by when we say that we need rest or we're tired. He said, we think we need physical rest. And he says, I know that's not the case because he says, immediately after you have a good night of sleep or two or three good nights of sleep, you still feel the same way. So he said, it's not a matter that you need more physical rest. And sometimes we do. That is another subject. But he said, I think we had misdiagnosed maybe what our symptoms are. He said, I think more than needing the physical rest, he said, we just need spiritual replenishment. We just need to be replenished spiritually. And I want to just land there for just a little bit. So many times we want to take a pill for what is going on with our body or our life or our, you know, and I'm not saying pills are not good, you know, in the right frame of everything, I'm sure the pills are very necessary. I'm sure right now Ed Gundram is glad for the pills after his major surgery yesterday, and he's got that little button he can push about every three minutes. He's probably looking at the clock and said, okay, there I can push it. I'm going to get some more pain relief. I understand that. But in many cases in our society, we think we just need another pill, a pill to make us sleep or a pill to, so we don't sleep, and, and then it's all messed up. And Dr. Cloud said, maybe we've got a law wrong. Because after you have all this rest, you're still no better. But he said, you need some spiritual replenishment. And sometimes, even in the Christian community, kind of who I'm talking to today, sometimes even in the Christian community, we look at that as a last resort for when we're tarred. We need some spiritual 
replenishment. We need some renewal from God. We need some more grace. We need some more goodness of God. We need to feel and sense the presence of God. We need maybe a spiritual breakthrough that God can really, really help us in that area of our life. David just simply said, the Lord is my shepherd. He makes me lie down. Then he restores my soul. And he restores my soul. So God doesn't preach a sermon to Elijah. He doesn't rebuke him. He doesn't say, where's your faith? Look what he says. He tells him to eat and get some rest. All at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his bed was some baked bread and hot, uh, um, over hot coals, and there was a jar of water. He ate and he drank, and then he laid down again. Sometimes, sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is get some good rest. And like we said last week, the Bible says, be still and know that I am God. Okay, in verse 7, God comes to him the second time. Aren't you glad that we have a God of second chances? Look what happens here. The angel of the Lord came back the second time, okay, and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up, ate and drank, strengthened by the food. He traveled 40 days and nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? I'm trying to picture this. I mean, it's, he gets help. He listens to the Lord. And he goes and he, on this journey, as soon as he gets there, he goes into a cave. <clears throat> I'm not a psychiatrist or a psychologist, but one thing that people do when they're depressed, they want to pull the blinds and shut the lights off. Many times they don't, they don't want to get out and about. This next part is all absolutely free. Did you know this? If you didn't, you know it now. Sometime is all you need to do is get out of the house or open the blinds, turn on the lights, take a ride, and come back home. Sometimes that could be all that you need. But you're depressed. When you're depressed, you just pull yourself in. And so he goes in this cave what are you doing? <laughs> There's times I ask people that. I've had guys that work for me before, and, and, and you thought for sure they knew exactly what to do. And, and you go and you look at the job and you say, What are you doing? <laughs> Just think about it. So, what are you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> he didn't get right the last time, and so here's the second time. Okay, so what are you doing? What is going on right now in your mind? Why are you staying awake at night? What is it that is really, really messing with you? Let's go to verse 10. He replied, I have been very jealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. Then God meets Elijah in his need. Your deepest need becomes a gift when it drives you to depend on God. Verse 11. Look at with, with me, will you, if you would, please. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the, of, of the Lord, for the Lord's about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore 
the mountain apart and scatter the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake was the fire, the fire came, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. Look at it. The wind, Lord wasn't there. Earthquake, Lord wasn't there. The fire, that wasn't it. The earth, the wind, and the fire. God was in none of those. Those things that we would think he would be in. Those things that are extravagant. Those things that are powerful. We would think he would be in them. But he wasn't. Matter of fact, he wasn't in the remarkable. He was in the ordinary. Might want to write that down. He wasn't in the remarkable. He was in the ordinary. God was in the whisper. When you're overwhelmed with pressures, when you're overwhelmed with finances, when you're overwhelmed and you're overwhelmed, when you're overwhelmed because of the kids, when you're overwhelmed because of a friend, you might say, why is he whispering? Why is he whispering? The reason he's whispering is because he is close. The reason he's whispering is because he is near you. How many times we want something flamboyant. We want something exciting. We want something whew, that gives a big story. And God can do anything he wants to do. He could have been in all those things. But for Elijah, he chose to be in the whisper. And for you today, it's very, very possible that God is just choosing. He's choosing to be with you in the whisper. The devil shouts out lies. God whispers truth. Not by shouting louder, but he's calling, he's calling me closer. He is with you. He is with me. He will never leave us. He'll never forsake us. Yep, you're in the storm. What happened when you were a kid? What happens when your kid was still home or is still home? And there's a big, big storm at night. It seems like the storms have to be at night, right? The kids run to your room. And even if they're not allowed in the bed, they still want to be in your room. And maybe in the morning when the storm's over and you wake up and you've got to walk over your kids because they're still laying in your room. Because they feel safe being close to you. Psalm 34 says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He saves those who are crushed in spirit. A scripture I had in the sermon section last week, but I put it in again this week. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? 
When I go up to the heavens, you are there. When I make my bed in the depths, of, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there will your hand guide me and your right hand will hold me fast. God with us.